didn't bring you here. You were here ever before we came. Lord, we have come. We need a word from you. We need to hear from you. For if we don't hear from you, what will we do? We need you to set a fire deep in our souls that we can't control, we can't contain. Give us more of you. No one ever came to a fire conference with you and left the same. The fire either roasted them to ashes or empowered them to do great things for you. May your fire this week not roast us. May it rekindle in us a passion for Jesus, a passion for the kingdom, and like we heard in the song, a passion for the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Welcome to the fire conference. God has always been a God of fire conferences. Because he's a consuming fire, remember? And all through the Bible, you find a God who calls a fire. Either for a sacrifice, or like in the case of Moses, a fire to redirect him to his divine course. Because God has set Moses aside to be a deliverer, to be a king, a shepherd to his people. But he got distracted serving the father-in-law. And the Bible tells us that God so arranged that the one thing the sheep needed, he never found. He kept roaming the countryside looking for grass. And then one day he found this green grass on the other side. Because they say the grass is only greener on the other side. And just when Moses was about to hear a sigh of relief, yeah, I found the grass. The Bible say he now saw fire on that grass. And he said, look, I can see fire, but the grass is not burning. It was not a fire to burn grass. It was a fire to draw Moses' attention to God's purposes for his life. May God's fire this week draw you from your distraction that you may focus on that which Jesus lay hold of your life. In Jesus' name. There was another conference, the fire conference in the New Testament. You know about it on the day of Pentecost? You remember that one? When the fire came, it turned timid, shy disciples like Peter into fire brands. It brought the miracles of God that the people of God could no longer be ignored. May fire come upon us Amen. that you will no longer be ignored. Amen. Not in the things of the world, but in the things of the kingdom. Amen. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I just want to give an overview. Tomorrow, God's helping us will go deeper. You see, when God gives us a theme for a meeting, it's not something to brush aside and say other things that we love to say. I have many favorite things I like talking about. But it is out of respect to God and his people that prayed to pay attention to the theme. And our theme this year is that the government shall be upon the shoulders of Jesus. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Isaiah 9, verse 6 up to verse 7. I want to share a few thoughts this night. Three. Which government is the Bible talking about here? Because we're in a season of politics. You know, you can push a political agenda with this thing. And you'll be correct because that's the season. But as a student of the Bible, I have learned to put every text within its context. Because a text without a context is a pretext. Which government? 
Whose shoulders is the Bible talking about here? What does shoulders mean to those people that first read this? And then which piece? Which piece? As we take an overview, God will lead us by his spirit to where he wants us to be today. And gradually up to when he brings our other brothers and brethren. But one thing I can guarantee you, this will be a fire conference like no other. Amen. It's either set your life on fire for God or roast you out of relevance. You choose. Amen. Amen. Friends, I read this from three different versions. And it says in New King James Version, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The, the Brenton Septuagint translation says, his empire shall be multiplied and there shall be no end of peace. So the Brenton used empire. The Good News Bible, his royal power will continue to grow. His kingdom will always be at peace. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So which government is the Bible talking about here? Is it the Nigerian government or British government that some people are trying to put the government on their shoulders? No. The Hebrew word used government here is, is Mizra. M-I-S-R-A-H. We talk about a principal of a territory. The English word translated is principality. Hallelujah. It speaks of dominion. It speaks of authority. Dominion and authority. Not position. Hallelujah. Not presidential or gubernatorial or local government chairmanship. It's not talking about that. It's talking about a man upon whom God puts dominion, puts authority, and makes him a ruler. You may occupy no position. Hallelujah. You see, in Daniel 2.44, the Bible talks about his kingdom. And in the days, God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces. God was talking about the kingdom of Jesus that will never be destroyed. His authority. In Matthew 28, remember, he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So it's authority. Hallelujah. So understand that this government is not talking primarily about the politics. It's talking about authority and dominion that God confers on his people. Beginning with Adam. When he made Adam in his image, after he liked it, so that they can have dominion. God placed the government of the then time upon the shoulders of Adam. If it were a democracy, Adam would not rule the garden. He was a minority. The, Probably the lion or elephant would have been king. It would have been an animal kingdom. They were in the majority. But see, the dominion and rule of God is not based on which position you occupy. It's based on whose nature and mandate you bear. May the Lord give you understanding. You may be the messenger in an office. With God, you can, the government of that company can be upon your shoulders. It happens in the occultic world. I knew an MD of a bank in this town. If you went to that bank for a loan, don't bother going to an executive director. Go to the messenger, the chief security man. He was the babalawo to the MD. If you could have your way through that security man, you can have your way with the MD. When it's time for promotion, people go to bribe, not the MD, the security man. If you needed a loan, you find a way of pacifying the security man. And we got to learn that that was the babalawo to the empty. 
security man, but the government of that bank was upon his shoulders. The world exalts position, so everybody is trying to be president, trying to be governor, because we don't understand authority. Hallelujah. So when the Bible speaks of the government, the authority of God, we sang it, he has made him both Lord and Christ. Acts 2, 36. Amen? Then, what does shoulders, whose shoulders? The Hebrew word for shoulder is shakem. It talks about this area between the neck and the shoulder where baggy people or other people carry load. Are you seeing these people that carry load? They put it here. So it's a place where God places authority. That's where burdens are placed. And in this case, it's talking about the shoulders of Jesus. Jesus is the one that God appointed to be the burden bearer. Even the, our sins were put on him. Hallelujah. Every burden God has, he places on Jesus. And when Jesus came on earth and started raising us as disciples, he transferred the burdens of God upon our shoulders. Come unto me, O ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you what? Rest. First thing he gives you is not work, it's rest. The first thing Jesus gives you is rest. So if you are here and you are restless, maybe from sin or troubles or needs, God is not calling you to this conference first to give you fire to go and preach. For you, it will be rest. He gives you rest first. But after you are rested, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in every church like this, you have two kinds of Christians. Those who are still restless. And those who are resting too much. Because after they found rest, they didn't take any yoke and burden. Church has become a rest room for them. May the Lord grant that. In this fire conference, you will find two things. Rest from your weariness. And a burden from the Lord. That's why the fire will drive. It will burn the dross that doesn't give you rest. And then place upon you the rest of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus asked, in Matthew, who do these people say that I am? And Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And just upon that rock, I will build my church. The work of building God's church and God's kingdom stands on Jesus. Amen? Amen. If it stood on Sankutu, it would have crumbled. Every hero of faith we know that is human has feet of clay. They are weak. Your favorite man of God is human. God forbid that his humanity will show. You know, there are times somebody was telling me about his man of God. And he said, he doubts if that man goes to the toilet. He doubts if that man eats. He's always fasting and praying. Anytime you see him, I say, go and ask his wife. Somebody was praising late Billy Graham. I said, don't take any story about me until my wife certifies it. But the others don't know me. They only know my name. Jesus is the one upon him God has put every burden and every yoke. That's why I say, cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you are carrying your cares, 
Somebody tell me, brother, take care. I said, I don't take care. I cast care. I'm careless because I cast my cares, not because I'm irresponsible. There are two different things. Amen. So Jesus is the shoulder that takes the authority of God. So what peace? The word for peace used there is shalom. It simply means complete, serene, secure. Hallelujah. The salvation that Jesus brings is total. When he says it is finished, it is truly what? Finished. They say false gospel going around. They say, no, Jesus finished 70%. And left 30% in the hands of your man of God. So the man of God will extract a price. If you give one particular offering, or if you do one particular service, or fast certain days, what Jesus did not complete will be completed by my ministry. What a heresy. When Jesus said it is finished, it is what? Finished. The best any man of God can do is to help open your eyes to what Jesus has done. What God does is perfect. You can't add to it. So, of the increase of his government and peace, the implication is this. If you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you only surrendered your hand to his control, your hand will have peace. The rest of your body will be burning. If you gave him your head, your head will have peace. So, surrender all. Amen? As his lordship over your life increases, whatever you bring under his lordship will know peace. Your sexuality will know peace if you bring it under his lordship. Your business, your family, even your body is his temple. You don't have a right to do with it what you please. Whatever you don't bring under his lordship will suffer war. So as his government increases, remember, he's the prince of peace. Is that not so? But a prince is no king until you enthrone him. So which area of your life are you here to enthrone him? Which area of your business? You see, if you check around the world, check. All the places troubling the world, <clears throat> ISIS, Boko Haram, Iswa, headsmen, militants from the Niger Delta, they all come from places where Jesus' Lordship hasn't yet reached. Have you not noticed? Check. Any part of the world that doesn't come under his Lordship suffers war. May God teach us in Jesus' name that as you leave this conference, your first assignment, write it down. I will bring every area of my life under his government so that his peace will increase. So, that's the peace of God. You see, God says the Messiah shall ever increase. There shall be no limit to his kingdom until it is ultimately filled. This will come to fruition when the gospel is preached. Because wherever the gospel goes, it declares the kingdom and lordship of Jesus. That's why we call it the gospel of the kingdom. Any gospel that does not declare Jesus as king and lord before Messiah has failed. Our world is in trouble. Men are in trouble. They are looking for Messiahs. But God doesn't come first as a Messiah. Acts 2.36, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Salvation is what you get when Jesus is Lord of your life. Salvation is a byproduct of lordship. The Bible never says, my Savior and my Lord. Check. My Lord and my Savior. 
A nominal Christian is that Christian who comes to Jesus and wants to use him to find answers to poverty, sickness, disease, demonic oppression, lack of marriage and children. He wants to get the benefits of Christhood and deny him lordship. That's nominal Christianity. It's like going to First Bank. I want leave allowance. I want holy, uh, housing allowance, but I don't want a job. Or going to a lady. I want romance, to kiss romance, but I don't want marriage. One is a product of the other. May God, tonight and for this week, help us and bring us to a point we will recognize him first as Lord then we can enjoy the messiahship. You know, the early disciples of Jesus, that's what confused them. In their search for a messiah, the Jews were looking for an emancipator. Somebody who will deliver them from the, the house of Fulani rule and the misrule of a Buhari. They were looking for an obedient person. Someone who will deliver them from the economic downturn. Those are just value added to God's kingdom. So when Jesus started talking about, I'm going to die before my kingdom will be established, they said, Peter rebuke him. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Don't talk about that. Remember in Acts, before that fire conference, in Acts 1, Say, Lord, when will you restore this kingdom to who? Israel. Whose turn is it to produce the presidency? Is it the south or the north? That's what the argument. When will you take Nigeria out of the hand of this Muslim and put it in the hand of Christians? As if we will not complain, even if a Christian comes. You make Baba Degwe president of Nigeria, even redeemed members will still complain. It's not about the person. It's about a structure that is remotely controlled by the devil. It doesn't matter who you put there. Some can give you palliatives, but until we abstain the dominion of darkness and enthrone light, forget it. And that's what we are called as a church to do first. May God give us fire. Amen. So to do. So, I want to, because you see, we need to understand God's vision and plan for the world. As Christians, we need to understand what exactly is God doing? What does God want? How do we fit in as a church, as individuals? Because if you don't know God's plan and purpose, you will be expending energy and scratching God where he's not itching. So what is God's plan? First, it's Habakkuk 2.14. God planned that the earth be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Hallelujah. The earth be filled. The time is coming when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what God wants. When he called Adam, he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. With what? With the knowledge of the glory of God. Because he was made in the fullness of God's glory. In God's image, in God's likeness. But when he derobed himself of the lordship of God and began to obey the enemy, he took on a sinful nature. And as he began to multiply, he was multiplying sinners and sin, not God's glory. And that's how God had to destroy the whole race and raise another man called Noah. Hallelujah. How will the earth be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? Everything that is God's glory is not wrapped up in Jesus. So to fill the earth with the knowledge of God's glory, you've got to fill the earth with Jesus. And the gospel is the means. Hallelujah. 
So wherever God places you, in the bank, in a school, in a neighborhood, his agenda is that through you, that area should be filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. He doesn't need to send a pastor there. In any given generation, less than 12% of Christians are in full-time ministry. Less than 12%. The vast majority are doing Uber, selling recharge card, working for Zenith and for any other thing, Total and Mobile and EFCC and police. And God's strategy is that you will be light and sought there. That those who won't come to church, you will be church to them. Those who don't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you will be a gospel to them. Amen. You see, the, another translation says, for the recognition of the Lord's sovereign majesty, we feel the end. That's what I mean by the glory. That men will recognize his sovereign majesty. This one that he has put upon Jesus. Men will recognize it. That was the mandate, the commission Adam and Noah had. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and govern it. Hallelujah. That last part, govern it, is a cultural mandate. Only Christians we're given an environmental right mandate to replenish the earth. But we are the ones destroying it. If ozone layer is eating up, it's we. You urinate anywhere, even when they say don't urinate. We trample upon any grass we see, even if they say do not touch. We destroy the earth. And then environmental rights activists stand up. See, any NGO you find is filling a gap the church ignored. May God help us to govern the earth. Start with your yard. Don't throw pure water sachet inside gutter and then we experience flood. Then you blame government. In fact, the presidential candidate that will vote is the one that will ban sachet water and leather back. The environmental degradation, that thing lasts thousands of years and doesn't get rotten. Hallelujah. Adam had that mandate. Noah had that mandate. Abraham, I will make you a great nation. We bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. Your offspring will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the mandate. God calls us in Christ to be fruitful. First, with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Those fruits of character and then multiply it. Then he calls us that as we interact with people with those fruits, they will see our good works and they will want to come under the lordship of Jesus. And so we we'll start winning people over to him. You have to be fruitful before you multiply, isn't it? One preacher opened my eyes to understand this truth. One of the reasons why Africa is poor, we multiply before we are fruitful. You haven't taken care of two children, you have ten. Huh? Even churches, you haven't established one branch, you want to establish ten. The first one will not grow. May God help us to be fruitful. And then multiply. Hallelujah. Man, then the great commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Hallelujah. God's ultimate desire is that 
After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. The ultimate desire of God is that men will gather unto him in worship from every tribe and every tongue. Hallelujah. Amen. That his house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations to gather. That the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. The glory of Solomon's temple was the architecture and its exclusivity it was for Jews only. But the glory of this new temple is that it shall bring in people from all nations. Hallelujah. So God has a goal to fill the earth with the knowledge of his glory. God has a goal that he will raise a generation of men and women who will be fruitful and multiply. God has a goal that he will bless us sufficiently to be a blessing to others. Amen? That's why he told Abraham, in blessing, I will bless you. I will make your name great. You see, but many believers seek greatness for themselves. And the Bible says, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Seek greatness for God, not for yourself. When God blesses you, it is not to raise your standard of living. It's to raise your standard of serving and giving. May he give you that understanding. Amen. When God puts you on the floor, he wants you to light the stage under. When he puts you here, he wants you to light this room. Hallelujah. When he puts you on the ceiling, he wants you to enlighten the environment that is VI. When God raises you, it is a platform to shine brighter. May you understand that in Jesus' name. So God has an ultimate purpose. In Psalm 72, 8, say, He shall rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the desire of God. Hallelujah. I want to end this evening by saying, not only does God have a desire, God has kingdom mysteries that he's hoping that in this fire conference we will understand, they will be revealed, and we will run with them in Jesus' name. What are those mysteries? Tomorrow we will tie them together. The first thing, in Ephesians 1.10, Paul said, these are mysteries to the rest of the people, but to you they have been revealed. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Hallelujah. So God's secret in building the church, in raising you and I, Making us who we are, have, to have what we have, to know what we know, to live where we live, was that through us, he will entrain the lordship of Jesus over all. Whatever God does in heaven and on earth is to honor Jesus, not you. May you understand that. Whatever he does through you on earth is to honor Jesus and his church. Because you will see one of the mysteries revealed has to do with his church. The church is not just to be a nice denomination doing nice program. God has more lofty plans for the church than that. But understand that Jesus, God wants Jesus to rule everywhere. Amen? Amen. And to rule through you and I. So if you are in First Bank or UBA as a believer, understand that you are not just there to collect salaries and come and pay tithes. You are there to entrain the Lordship of Jesus. You may never be MD or GM, but if you can remain in the nature of Christ, God has made you priest and king. Amen? Amen. To rule. Now priests are intercessors. 
you take the burdens of that organization to God in prayer. You are the intercessor. And as long as you are interceding, God will be giving you secrets that even the MD doesn't know. And when Joseph reveals secret, he became prime minister. I hope you know. You become a confidant. That's his goal. Through your life, through your witness, through the good works of your life, your light so shine before men. They see your good work. They won't give you glory. They will give glory to who? To God. That's the primary purpose. If that brings you promotion, glory to God. If it doesn't, you've lost nothing. The Lordship of Jesus. Whoever else is governor of Lagos, God wants Jesus to rule Lagos. That every knee will bow. I, we are his parliament. We pass a decree here that God, we don't want this thing that last man is doing. Lord, and not because they arrested your car for doing wrong, but because they are oppressing people. Before you know it, one governor said, last man disbanded. You don't need to carry an SARS protest. You just need to go on your knees and rule. We rule on our knees in agreement. So the devil makes sure we don't agree. The dominion of Jesus. The church, in Ephesians 3, 5, and 6, he said this is another secret. And now, in this last day, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be revealed unto all principalities and powers. Amen? Through the church, the wisdom of God in all its varieties, engineering wisdom, power sector wisdom, economic management wisdom, church administration wisdom, social service wisdom, ASU management wisdom, labor relations wisdom, will come through the church. How will it come? When God puts the burden upon any of his children, that how could public university be closed down for almost a year? And nobody's going on the street. I even saw some nuns people at the party conventions. Then it becomes a burden. Say, God, I'm also a member of ASU. Lord, what can I do from my colleagues' end? When they go for a Zoom meeting, God will just make you a Gamaliel. Oh, you are in government. You are not even the pound sake in Ministry of Labor or Education. But as you are praying, God will say, go and speak to the pound sake. This could be the way out. Before you know it, the problem is resolved. Hallelujah! Why should Nepal be taking light every time? And I'm an electrical engineer with Holy Spirit. You go and lock yourself up. You are not fasting for a car. God, deliver Nigeria from darkness. Have you noticed that all the inventions of Europe came after revival by believers? I was in Korea, South Korea. And the president of the South Korean Academy of Sciences is a believer. He came to a meeting, I was speaking like this, and he called me. I think I was speaking on this scripture. He said, look, what you are saying, let me tell you why Korea became an industrial country. They were importing everything like us. And then he said, one year, three of them found themselves in the Academy of Sciences. And they told them, say, how can God put us here and will not improve production in South Korea? How could they went to the hills? He started telling the story of Dewu, Samson, Kia, Hyundai. They came out of the travail. Hallelujah. Amen. 